Hello everyone, and welcome to another SOLIDWORKS Tech Tip from Hawkridge Systems. This is Jacob Ames, Senior Applications Engineer. And if you've been trying to figure out how to add items to a bill of materials without actually modeling them in your assembly, stay tuned. In this video, we'll be covering a few different strategies for doing exactly that, allowing you to customize your bombs and represent every piece of data you need with minimal effort. Here we have an assembly of a box with a handful of components, and while the construction is simple enough, there's a few additional things I'd like to represent in the assembly that I don't necessarily want to model. These are often purchased components that don't need to be shown in the model, non-CAD components like decals and labels, or consumables such as adhesives, and certain types of fasteners. Fortunately, these types of components are easy to document, and there's a number of different methods for doing so to complement different workflows and provide flexibility for your bills of materials. Here in my current bomb, I have most of my components ballooned and ready to go. For this box design, however, I plan on purchasing a rubber mat to line the bottom of it, and I really don't want or need to physically model it in the assembly. When this is the case, one of the simplest methods to represent a component is through the use of what we call a ghost component. Back in the assembly, I'll use the new part command and save it with a name and location. Normally this is a strategy that would be used for in-context modeling, where we'd add some sketch geometry and model a new part in the assembly. If you'd like to learn more about that, in-context design, uh, make sure to check out our video on the subject which I've linked in the description below. In our case, since we're not actually modeling anything, we can just click a face of the assembly to start the new part, and then use the confirm sketch button to exit sketch mode. You'll want to use the confirmation button a second time to exit back to the top level assembly. Keep in mind, this process does create a real part document file on the system, and this needs to be considered for file management purposes. If showing the part name in the assembly bomb is all you care about, then the job is done at this point. Going back to the drawing, you'll see that the bomb has been updated to include the new component, but keep in mind that if a balloon is created for a ghost component, it'll attach to the face you selected back in the assembly when initially creating it, and you won't have much flexibility in ballooning. That being said, you may also want to add additional file properties to the ghost component. If this is the case, you can just open it up in its own window and add file properties like you would with any normal component. This will then update the bomb with the file properties. Now let's say I want to represent some finishing nails for putting the wood pieces together. We can approach this in a couple different ways, the first of which is using ghost components like we did for the rubber mat. This time, however, I'm going to adjust some system settings first. In the Assemblies category, in System Options, you'll find a checkbox that says Save New Components to External Files. If this is checked on, you'll see the same behavior you saw earlier in this video. If this option is instead cleared, ghost parts will be created as virtual components, which do not create new documents on the system, but rather components that exist only within the assembly. This is great for file management, because there's no additional files to manage, but you'll find that component names become a bit difficult to control, as they include a reference to the assembly name. At this point, I've created a virtual component to represent a finishing nail. Just like before, you can open the component in its own window to add some additional file properties if desired, and the bill of materials will automatically update to include the component. To adjust the quantity, you also have a couple options. Now you can double click the cell uh, for quantity and override it, which is the simplest strategy, but be aware that this will break the associative link to the assembly, so if you add more of the same component at the assembly level, the quantity will be unaffected. But you can always restore this link by simply clearing the cell value. If you prefer to retain this link, you can instead copy and paste the component within the assembly until you have the desired number of components, and of course the bomb will update accordingly. However, this often results in a very long design tree in the assembly. If you'd like, you can always use folders to clean up the design tree, or even form virtual sub-assemblies to group your components together. Virtual assemblies can be especially useful for those of you who prefer to use the indented bill of materials type. If you'd like to learn more about sub-assembly component options for bills and materials, be sure to check out the video linked in the description below for more information. Now, ghost parts can be great for documenting non-CAD items while providing some data management capabilities, and in most cases is the strategy we'd recommend. However, it is possible to modify a bill of materials directly by manually adding rows. Please keep in mind though, adding a row to a bomb doesn't allow for any type of file management and is essentially guaranteed to create an inconsistency between your assembly and drawing, so please use this technique at your discretion. To add a row to a bomb, simply right click an existing row, access the insert menu, then choose row above or row below. 
You'll then need to double-click the cells of the row and manually add information as needed, and the warning that appears will inform you that any parametric links back to the assembly will be broken by doing this. Manually filling out the row allows you to represent non-CAD data in the bomb without creating ghost parts, but creating balloons for these items is rather involved. To do so, start by creating a balloon manually and place it as you see fit. Then, and this part is very important, select the balloon and change the balloon text field to the text option. This will allow you to input the proper item number without disturbing the rest of the item numbers in the bomb, but keep in mind that this balloon will not update if the order of the bomb is changed in the future. Finally, to delete a row, right-click the row header on the far left of the table, select Delete, then Row. The remaining items should automatically renumber, if applicable. If you find that your needs for organizing your bill of materials are more advanced than what you've seen so far, or especially if you work with SOLIDWORKS PDM or multiple bomb sources, I'd highly recommend doing some research on our XBOM product. I've linked a video in the description below covering XBOM, which allows you to build a comprehensive bill of materials from multiple sources without implementing a full PLM system, so make sure to check it out if you're interested. Last but not least, if you'd like to represent non-CAD data, but you don't need to add the component to your bill of materials, you have a couple additional options. You can always create a note with a leader from the Annotations tab, and then simply customize the text to reflect the component. Easy enough. Another approach that some designers prefer to take is to use flag notes. This strategy first requires the creation of a flag note bank. To create this, start by creating a note and give it a title if desired. Then, and this part is critical, click on the button in the formatting toolbar to make the note a numbered list. Flag notes will not work unless the note includes a numbered list. Type in the names of the materials or components you'd like to include, and once the list is complete, you can click on the number preceding an item while you're editing the note, and a property manager will appear. A checkbox will be available to add the item to the flag note bank. Once checked, you can change the border and size properties of the flag note symbol as desired. Once the flag note bank is completed, you can add flag notes to the drawing views through the balloon command. Click the checkbox titled Flag Note Bank, then choose the item you'd like to represent, and then add it to the drawing view. And just like that, you can now represent consumables or other components without affecting the bill of materials. With the approaches covered here, you should now be able to represent anything you want in your assembly drawings, modeled or otherwise. We hope you learned something valuable from this video, and if you did, give it a like and let us know what you think about these workflows in the comments. If you haven't already, consider subscribing to the channel for weekly tech tip videos on everything SOLIDWORKS and easy access to our huge library of existing tips and tricks. Finally, if you're looking to become a true SOLIDWORKS expert, be sure to check out HawkridgeSys.com for more information on the SOLIDWORKS certification program and learn about all our professional SOLIDWORKS training opportunities. With that, thanks for watching and see you next time.